Ambassador Gubeb, Dr. Gross, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today on what I think is a potentially momentous day in our combined entangled histories. Um, I think really we are looking at new ways of working as museums and I think uh, the conversations we are having uh, in these recent, uh, recent months is really leading us in new directions. I'm here to provide a perspective from the Namibian museum sector. The Museums Association of Namibia is a non-governmental organization that supports regional museum development. A lot of our work is engaged in reimagining the concept of a museum in Namibia. And we often struggle to free our minds from the conceptual frameworks and the techniques that are based on the prioritization of the object. We are currently involved in a number of exciting projects that include the development of a museum of Namibian music and mobile exhibitions that engage with Namibian objects held in collections beyond our borders. Many people perceive the mission of the museum as educational, to increase understanding, to provide windows that give views across time and space. However, I'll argue today that museums have the opportunity to reinvent themselves as tools to increase mutual understanding. Museums should strive to become institutions that no longer rest on a didactic claim to knowledge about other places and other people. Instead of creating others, it's important and possible for museums to become vehicles for international dialogue. One of the ways in which we have tried to encourage dialogue has been through the development of the Africa Accession Network that Dr. Forster mentioned. There was a small project initiated in 2015 with colleagues from Botswana, Renani is here with us, Zambia and Zimbabwe, and support from the International Council of Museums, ICOM. Our starting point was an awareness of our ignorance about the location, the size, and the content of objects from our countries that are held in collections in European museums. Correspondence was sent out to museums in Finland, Germany, Sweden, and the UK. The replies indicated to us which museums had important collections, which were willing to share information and images about their objects, and which were interested in dialogue with Namibian museums and Namibian communities. I'll argue that the location where artifacts from Namibia are displayed is important to identity. But it's important not only for the identity of the descendant communities of those who originally manufactured, encountered, or used the objects in Namibia. It's also important for the identity of Germany. Whilst German museums may no longer, may, may, maybe, may no longer celebrate colonialism, it's important that they consider the messages that the choices they make of either returning or retaining objects transmit. What messages does that give? Does Germany still accept unethical actions that took place during its colonial period, or does it wish to clearly reject those attitudes and develop new relationships with countries such as Tanzania and Namibia? I feel that the winds of change are blowing through the corridors and the display cabinets of European museums. As a museum worker based in Africa, with an opportunity to speak here today, I must take this opportunity to state that I welcome the new direction signaled in the speech of President Macron of France. The President clearly stated the need for, quote, the restitution of African heritage to Africa, and even proposed a five-year time frame. I also note the call from Professor Dr. Herman Parsinger President of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Association, calling for the development of international guidelines on provenance research, 
and the repatriation of objects acquired in the colonial period, although I note that he spoke with more caution regarding the time frame. I welcome the recent commitment in Germany to support provenance research of colonial collections, but again note that this research must not be limited to museum archives, but also involve the so-called source communities, and I'll give an example of what I mean later. I must say I'm a little concerned in Dr. Parsinger's reported statement that I, as it was reported to us, but if you are conducting provenance research, then you also have to expect that you will come across objects that came into the collection illegally, and you'll have to be willing to hand them back. And I think we've already raised this question of legality in the, rather than the moral justification regarding return and restitution. So I think this is a statement that needs to be clarified, what we mean with the whole reference to legality in this context. I'd like to make the argument that the location of museum objects matters. I'll illustrate my argument by talking about two stones that traveled between Africa and Europe. The first is a piece of rock that traveled from Africa to Europe, and the second is a piece of rock that traveled from Europe to Africa. I believe that the story of the first can help us reflect on the second. Because, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important that we reconfigure, reconceptualize provenance research. And I think Dr. Hendrickson's presentation has given some idea of the different ways in which we can think about location and meaning. But provenance research must go beyond thinking just about museum archives and documentation attached to the object and also think about the intangible cultural heritage and the place associated with the object. And my first example is going to speak to that. The first rock I'll talk about was a fragment that was hacked off via Omililo Guemania Loishilongo. This refers to a stone. OK, sorry, translators. <laughs> This refers to a stone that has been described as the power stone of the Ndonga Kingdom of Northern Namibia. The Ministry for Foreign Affairs of the Finnish government have shown sensitivity to the goodwill that can be generated by the repatriation of objects of particular sacred significance. And since Namibian independence, uh, two stones in the collection, former collection of the Finnish Mission Museum were identified as sacred stones that have been taken from Avambo kingdoms in northern Namibia. Two of these have already been returned to Namibia. The so-called power stone of the kingdom of Okwanyama was returned to the Kwanyama traditional authority in 1990. And in 2014, the stone that was an important symbol of royal power in the Mbalantu kingdom was returned to the Mbalantu traditional authority. The stones were sacred objects and it was believed that if they were removed from the kingdom or damaged, serious misfortune would strike the kingdom. The Museums Association of Namibia was able to get support from the Embassy of Finland to visit museums with Namibian collections that had been identified through the Africa Accession Project. A small team from Namibia was supported to visit the six museums in Finland, which held the most significant collections from Namibia. After the visit, the report of the Namibian team made 25 recommendations for potential partnerships and collaborative projects. I'm pleased that it's also been possible to obtain some assistance um, to visit several museums in Germany. And we think that it will be important, in the, not just with the Cape Cross, but with museums in uh, Germany generally. But a, a similar report is produced so that we answer that question of what Namibian objects are where. One of the positive outcomes of a visit to Finland was that we were provided with a complete set of photographs. And I think this is often the first step we need, photographs of objects in museum collections. We had a complete set of photographs of the estimated 2,592 yeah, 2, Namibian cultural artifacts that were held by the Museum of the Finnish Missionary Society. 
After its closure in 2014, that collection was moved to the storage depots of the National Museum of Finland. And one thing that's clear to us with our initial research is that most of our Namibian objects in European museums are not on display, but are sitting in cupboards. One of the images that we saw caught our attention. And we asked for a translation of a Finnish entry on the old card index system that had been used to catalogue a collection. The translation identified the rock as a piece of the Ndonga sacred stone, Oshipapa. The caption can be related to a description from a diary entry of Malti Rautinen, perhaps the most prominent Finnish missionary to work in northern Namibia. The diary account of the way in which the stone was acquired has been summarized by Marty Peltola. And I'll quote that story. In February 1886, Martin Rautinen and Dr. Schintz had taken a trip to the site of the late king Nembungu's court, which was to the east of Olukonda, a few hours' journey on an ox wagon. Their attention was drawn to an enclosure. When he asked what it was, they were told there were amulets there used in making rain, and it was forbidden to examine them. Rautinen knew that there was a stone inside the enclosure, but he'd also heard of a special stone which was near there. Part of the stone was visible. Its surface rose slightly from the ground. Dr. Schintz was in a way disappointed because the stone was evidently not meteorite but quartzite. In order to be able to study it closer, he and Rautinen both cut pieces for themselves and then covered the sides of the stone with sand as they had been before. Before they returned, Rautinen's attention was drawn to a heap of wood which nobody had taken home, though firewood was scarce. They were wooden posts used for building a stockade. They were standing on the site of the court of King Nembungu, a circumcised king who had ruled in Dongo a generation before, perhaps in the 1830s, and had been held in high regard. The description gives insight into the dynamics of collecting fever. On the one hand, missionaries sought to obtain objects that linked with local religious practices, while Dr. Schintz, the scientist, was interested in the geological properties of the object. The point is that the removal separated this item from the site of the king's grave and buried it in a box, in a cupboard, in a storage room, in a building in Helsinki. The location of the stone in the ground near the king's grave had been central to its rainmaking process. Indeed, rainmaking is remembered in Oshindonga as Okusagela Kumvula Imenge, which translates as to make rain in the grove of the king's grave. The king's grave was a place laden with sacred significance and was preserved and maintained by the community. Traditionally, the body of the king was not buried, but wrapped in the skin of a black cow and surrounded by wooden stakes. Perhaps these were the poles that were referred to. A family was selected to live near the grave and given the task of tending the grave and replacing the stakes as they rotted. So it was a, a, a site of, of continuing significance. And the task was passed on from generation to generation until Christianization halted the practice. The site was clearly a sacred site, and the stone was one of the number of items associated with the site. So in Namibia, as we like to say, not all trees are trees, and not all rocks are just rocks. I describe the case of the fragment of the Ndonga power stone because it's also a current case, and illustrates the importance of three factors when considering a request for restitution. It's important to review the ethics of the way in which the object was collected. And this would cover such concerns as whether informed consent was obtained, whether the object was removed by force, and other factors. It's also important to consider the strength of the link between the object and the place where it was obtained. And finally, attention should be given to the significance of the object, to the intangible cultural heritage of the community that it was obtained from. The second rock I'll talk about was carved into a monument. 
and later hacked off an outcrop on the harsh coast of Namibia and transported to Berlin. It's a rock that has been accessioned and catalogued as the Cape Cross. Within the context that I've outlined already, I'd like to consider the three dimensions of the Cape Cross. Firstly, as a physical, mobile object, but also as an immobile heritage site and a concept that connects with different intangible narratives. And I'd like to provide a few thoughts on each of these three dimensions. Firstly, we have the physical object, the Cape Cross as a thing, here in Berlin, upstairs. The object has a biography, and we've heard about this already. It's been transported, and it's been reproduced, replicated. But the copies were not copies. The copies were revisions, re-imaginings of the Cape Cross. The first paper, the, the original Portuguese cross was made from Portuguese limestone. The German replica was made from German granite. The Namibian replica of the Portuguese cross was made from Namibian dolerite. Just to show you, that's a Namibian replica. <laughs> Within the physicality of these objects and their construction, each nation has sought to claim the Cape Cross and shape it in its own form. Secondly, if we think of a Cape Cross as a heritage site, then like the Ndonga Power Stone, the meaning of the Cape Cross to me is tied to its intended location on the African coastline. Even the way in which the object has been labeled through time emphasizes its link with a particular geographical location. People sailed with a one-ton rock across the Atlantic Ocean to put it in a particular place. My view would be that the Cape Cross would therefore be best located in a museum that tells its story in the context that gives this object its meaning. There are a number of options. One is that Namibia is due to open its own National Maritime Museum at Luderitz in 2019, which aims to be an educational and inspirational space. The museum will provide insights into the impact on Namibian history of our contact with rivers and oceans and the people who traveled across them. However, the museum will also display a broader global history of maritime history. And Luderitz is, of course, the location of the replica of the Padrao, which was erected by Bartolomeu Diaz in 1488, four years after the Cape Cross. Of course, there are other options, but I'm just citing this one because sometimes we have the uh, statement that can Namibia look after museum objects? And I just want to show we have museums, we have spaces. Finally, the Cape Cross can be read in terms of the storylines within which it has been inserted. The Cape Cross can, of course, be positioned within the, the, the narratives, the stories of three different nations. And this has been mentioned, the Cape Cross can represent, can be a hero or a villain in three different stories. The Namibian perspective would be that it embodies evidence of the earliest encounters with Europeans and the new religion that they introduced. Indeed, the earliest objects to reach Namibian soil were heavily laden with religious symbolism. You may have heard of the discovery of the oldest shipwreck in Southern Africa, which was named the Bon Jesus, the son, the, the good Jesus. And this vessel was smashed on the Namibian shore in 1533. So Namibia could be one of the best places in Southern Africa where the story of the region's early encounters with Europe could be told. A second Portuguese perspective might focus on nostalgia for its role as a 15th century superpower. As has been mentioned, the discourse of exploration and discovery and the triumph of technology. The latter might reflect on the design of the caravel that was able to transport Portuguese sailors across thousands of kilometers of ocean and the navigational equipment such as the astrolabe and quadrant that gave him some idea about the direction that they were taking. A display might all even research a calculation 
that is contained on the cross that led them to conclude that the world had been created exactly 6,685 years before they landed, placing the creation of the earth in the year 5,200 BC. But finally, the German narrative. What is the German narrative? How does the Cape Cross fit into the German history museum and its story? As we've seen, it is located in the 15th century as part of a European story of discovery. But I feel that the location of the Cape Cross within the German History Museum really contextualizes the Cape Cross as a symbol of German colonialism. German colonialism can be viewed as a system that not only enabled the extraction of raw materials from Namibia, but also the excavation of heritage and the removal of heritage objects and the rewriting of history. As has been mentioned, the German replica of the Cape Cross that was erected in Namibia to replace it added the crest of the German Empire and the inscription that had been erected by the command of the German Kaiser and King of Prussia, Wilhelm II. In addition, in the foundations of the replica, a brass cylinder was buried containing documents. One of them was a poem by the Dr. Fiedler, the medical doctor on the German cruiser, which had transported the replica cross from Germany. The poem read, in roaring seas battered by storms, stand fast forevermore, bear witness of Germany's glory and power in these latitudes. So the poem really encapsulates that this replica was a marker of, of German power in Southern Africa. The physical endurance of the Cape Cross was to be a witness of the imagined durability of Germany's, what was then, new global empire. I think that it would be easy to conclude my, letter, my lecture with a negative message. I could argue that Germany is holding on to artifacts that are part of the cultural heritage and history of Namibians, perhaps because it does not want to fully confront the legacy of its colonial past. However, I'm a stubborn optimist. I'd rather end with a positive proposition. I'd like to argue that if a museum is involved in a restitution claim, it should not see this as a threat. It's not the threat of leaving a gap in a display cabinet, a space in a gallery. Instead, a museum should see it as an opportunity Restitution presents an opportunity to fill a gap, to build new relationships with the place that the object came from and the people that live there. The new relationship can spawn new forms of cultural collaboration. Dealing with restitution can create barriers, but it could also create bridges. The choice is ours. Thank you. <laughs>